Monday, we are going to be doing soil erosion. Uh, and then uh, when we come back, obviously we're not, well, not obviously, we're not having class on Wednesday. Have a great Thanksgiving. But when you come back from Thanksgiving, Monday, Wednesday, Friday lecture is going to be all about soil quality. I, I, I promise we're going to be talking about soil pollution too. I, know, I don't know if, how far you guys have looked at the calendar. I promise that we will be talking about uh, um, soil pollution as well. But Monday, Wednesday, Friday, that last week, we're going to be focusing mostly on issues of soil quality, um, that, that component. OK, uh, any questions? Good to go? No? All right? No? I don't care at this point. Uh, again, I have a better shirt on than everybody in this room. Um, all right. So uh, we ended the last lecture on talking about what the fertilizers were. Um, and we talked about all the different nutrients and things like that uh, and the sources of those nutrients for fertilizer. Um, I think this is actually, I want to talk about um, how we make decisions about nutri nutri nutrient management, fertility management. Um, I'm going to be coming mostly from the front end, i.e. Um, uh, how, how we deal with amendments. Um, but when you start talking about nutrient management and fertility management, you also have to start talking about waste. Okay? And I mean waste not in, the, not in the sort of traditional sense, you know, it's stuff leaving the site, but i.e., um, actually that's what I mean. I, I do mean actually stuff leaving the site. Uh, usually when you start talking about waste, uh, nutrient management, um, there's the connotation that you're, you're just talking about one component of the nutrient cycle on your farm or your pot or whatever it is. Um, today, what I want to talk about up front, I'm going to start talking about the, how we bring stuff in. But I also want you guys to think about you know, once it's on the, in the system, whatever that system is, what's going to happen to it within that system. Because you have to consider, I mean, the, the, literally the last slide I have for today's lecture is the nutrient cycle, is the nitrogen nutrient cycle. Okay? Because when you're thinking about fertilizer, and fertility and nutrients and how you're managing your field or your pot or your garden or whatever it happens to be, you have to think about the whole system. But generally, we don't. Generally, we think about, well, I need to get this amount of fertilizer on my farm. I'm going to add this. OK, does that make sense? All right. So how do we make decisions about fertility management? Well, hey, man, I, I thought it's, nope, OK, this is right. Okay. Um, well, generally, we need to make decisions about our fertilizer needs, our nutrient needs. Okay? And we diagnose this by a number of different procedures. The first one, and most of us do this, we look at our plants and, and we look at how they're behaving and we sort of make an educated guess. Now, this can be coming from experience. Many of, these, many of the farmers, many of the greenhouse operators, many of the gardeners, they've had this plant in the ground for a while. And they see these types of responses, and they, they know what they need to do, and they've done it the, this way in the past, okay? and they've had success. Okay? Now, often this is based on either uh, visual observation, visual diagnostic features. Some of these can be fairly am ambiguous. But we, we look at what's going on on our field or pot or whatever, and we make decisions based on that. Okay? We also can basically make decisions based on analysis of soil samples. We take the soil that the plants are growing in, or will be growing in, and we do analysis of it to give us an idea about how much nutrients are in that system. Okay? Uh, we also can analyze the plants themselves. We can take tissue samples. We take these tissue samples, we send them to the lab, we get an estimation of what the, or an estimation, we get an analysis of how much nutrients are in these plants or this this type of tissue, if it's a leaf or root or whatever it happens to be. And based upon that, we can see where the deficiencies are, and then we can make decisions about what type of nutrients need to go into the system so that the plants can take them up. Um, we also have nutrient response trials. Okay, well, I've talked a little bit about these before, but basically this is where we have, this is why Cornell and many of the land grants have lots of farms across the entire state, okay, or whatever state they're in. Okay, the idea here is, we look at a diversity of different crops, a diversity of different soils, a diversity of different cl climates. And then we trial, we, we basically lay out those plants, and we trial them. And we provide different levels of nutrients, or whatever happens to be the question for management. And we see how, they're, how they perform. 
So we then use that information to make recommendations for future use or for future management. Does that make sense to everybody? Okay. Now, <clears throat> we're going to be talking about nutrients. So how, in fact, do we determine how much nutrients are needed for plants? Okay. Again, we can do that educated guess type of thing. Well, you know, I give it a little bit of this and I get this kind of response. Okay. Well, we could do that, but we actually could measure those responses. This is the field trial. Back to the field trial. We can measure those responses. Okay. So here is a response curve looking at yield and then the amount of nutrients that are, that are added okay, of X type. It could be nitrogen, phosphorus, whatever it happens to be. You then plot your plant's response to it. Okay. If you have a positive response, you're basically looking at a soil that's deficient. At some point, when you start getting a negative response, you're getting up to levels that are toxic. But if you get this positive response, you definitely have a deficient soil. Okay. Now, if you do the same thing and you don't get a response, it's basically a flat line, and then if at higher levels you start seeing this dropping down, you're so you're seeing the toxic effect at this end, you're basically looking at a soil that is non-deficit. In essence, you're looking at this part of the curve on your soil. Does that make sense? Yeah? Okay. The last thing, and, and this has a lot to do with how, I mean, this is how we make determinations about how much nutrients we eat, but a lot of this has to do with this response curve. Okay? The last sort of thing that we think about when we're trying to determine how much fertilizer we use is we think about the yield expectations. Okay? The, how much yield we're going to be getting for the fertilizer. And the, and the take home point here is it's very rarely the maximum yield. It's usually what we call the optimum yield. Okay, does this, has anybody ever heard this term before? Have you guys talked about this in like field crops and stuff like that where we're looking at response curves? Okay, so if this is my, we can use that as my response curve. Okay, so this is yield over here and this is concentration of whatever fertilizer, whatever nutrient it is. Okay. Now, I'm going to give nutrients to a certain amount right here, and I'm going to get some sort of response. Okay? And if I keep doing this, I'm going to get a response that looks something like this, and then sooner or later I'm going to get some sort of toxic. Potentially, if it's potassium or something like that, it's going to keep going straight. Okay? But think about this. My maximum yield is right here. Right? So about this much fertilizer, nutrient. But look at this curve. The flat, you know, the flat end of my curve, or I should say the steep, let's start with the front end. The steep part of this curve is actually from here to here. So for the amount of fertilizer that I'm getting, I'm putting in this field, the nutrients that I'm putting in this field, I'm getting a dramatic result, response. From here to here, I'm not really getting that much. So it turns out that optimum yield is actually right around here. You know, for every dollar I put into fertilizer, I'm getting two, two pounds of whatever. Okay? Out here, for every dollar I put in, because every one of these spots, every, you know, every incremental increase in my fertilizer, that's more money. But I'm getting a very small response for this amount of money. So let's say this was $10 here. It took me $10 to get to here. And this is probably about another $10 to get to here. For my first $10, look at the response that I got. For my second $10, look at the response I got. Maximum, optimum. Make sense? All right, so my rate of fertilizer added, or how I determine, is going to be based on this sort of educated guess, my experience, okay, these measured responses, and my yield expectations. All right, so how do we find what's actually in the soil? How do we do this soil testing? Okay, well, we need to figure out the test has to be a measurement of availability, okay, and the test must be fairly fast. Okay, because if it's not fast, it takes me a couple of years to get the data or a couple of months to get the data. My plant 
has already lived through that life cycle. Okay? It needs to be fairly inexpensive. If these tests are expensive, the farmers aren't going to be able to use them. Okay? It also needs to be fairly simple. It can't be some sort of complex thing that you have to do in the farm to get a response, to get another piece of information, to get another piece of information. It's basically got to be a very simple test. And finally, and this is perhaps the most important, it has to be correlated to the plant response. If it's not going to show you what the plant's going to do, it's not really going to be a worthwhile test. Make sense? Okay. And it's not just issues of deficiency, but it also is issues of toxicity. Remember what that response curve is. Right now, we have uh, successful soil tests for uh, phosphate, basically uh, uh, potassium, zinc. We have uh, acidity tests very well and salinity tests. Simple tests for nitrogen and sulfur are a little problematic. Sulfur is actually not that bad. Nitrogen, we can test for nitrogen. But the question here is it's not necessarily the simplicity of the test, it's the response of the nitrogen that's in the soil. We've talked about this, right? Okay. When we talked about this, we don't do these things, when we were talking about this in the, in the lab, why don't we have successful tests for nitrogen? It's not that we don't, but the data from the test is pretty hokey. Why? You, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I take a test today, tomorrow the nitrogen levels can be totally different. Yeah, the test is really simple, but it's pretty meaningless. Okay, and that goes back to this component of what the test has to be able to do. All right, <clears throat> so all these tests extract some part, uh, actually in some cases they do total analysis, but all these te soil tests basically extract, ex extract some part of the soil's total supply of element. Okay? These tests have to reflect the plant's ability to get the nutrient out. Just because the nutrient is in the soil doesn't necessarily mean the plant can get it. Does that make sense? Okay, so look at this graphic for a section. We're going to look at phosphorus. Okay? Imagine this larger circle represents the total pool of phosphorus that's in the soil. Okay? This smaller circle this little, with dots in here basically represents of this large pool, how much of that pool is actually available and what kind. Okay? Phosphorus is a really good example. Okay? If this was a low pH soil, this, this total pea pool was in a low pH soil, the vast majority of this phosphorus would be associated with iron and aluminum. And it wouldn't be available for the plants, right? A very small part of that phosphorus pool would, in fact, be available. Does that make sense? Yeah? OK. So my test can't reflect how much phosphorus total pool. It has to reflect, or it, not to reflect, it has to diagnose just the part of the pool that is available to the plants. So if I have a test like B here, that doesn't actually test that available pool, it's pretty unsuccessful as a test to tell me what's going to happen to the plants, right? A successful test is going to be looking at this available phosphorus pool. Does that make sense? Now, one other consideration, and we talked about this in when we were doing soil testing or soil, soil sample collection when we were going out to uh, Dillman Hill, but we also did when we were doing the soil mapping exercise. Soil sampling, you've got to sample your soils so that they actually represent what your plants are going to be in. Okay? Uh, remember we started, when we were at Dillman, we, had, we took the bucket out there and you guys took lots of samples, threw them in the bucket, mixed them up, and then pulled it out. Okay? What we were trying to do is get a representative sample of the management unit that you guys were or that the, the people at Dillman were growing the, growing the, the crops, right? If I had taken one individual sample, that sample perhaps, probably, would not have reflected the entire unit. You guys remember that we had that little blackboard exercise, and I drew a picture of the map, and I said, okay, well, you know, if I take one sample of this field, does it really represent the diversity of this field? Probably not. Now, the reality is when I start doing multiple samples, collecting multiple samples and throwing them in the bucket, not any one of those single samples probably doesn't reflect the entire nature of the field. 
But when I throw them all together and take a sample out, I'm getting the average of that field, in essence, sort of the average of that field. Now, the reality is I could have stuff that's really low. I mean, the, the fluctuation of characteristics of that field could be pretty dramatic. But the reality is I'm going to be managing that field pretty much as one single unit. And that's why we think about this. Your sample point is, or your sample that you're sending in for analysis really needs to reflect the characteristics of the field and how you're going to be managing it. And that's why we suggest, recommend doing these composite samples. All right. Screen's not advancing. There we go. All right, now, one other thing to think about when we actually talk about soil testing, there are a lot of different landscapes, biomes across the world. Okay? One test for nitrogen or phosphorus or whatever it happens to be isn't necessarily going to work for all different regions across the world. So you need to have a test that's calibrated for your type of landscape. Now around here we basically use Morgan's testing for a nutrient availability. Malik is another option. Okay? These tests, these are just people's names that they've given them to their tests. These tests are basically used for different extractions of different types of soils. Okay? Your tests, I mean these tests need to reflect the regionality of where you're taking your tests from. Okay? They needed, but they also need to be calibrated locally. This goes back to the land grants and these farms that are all over the state. They need to test these tests, test these tests locally so that the test reflects the characteristics of that local environment. Does that make sense? And we're calibrating it based on some yield. Okay, here you've seen this. This is basically that drawing over here. Here is phosphorus for wheat yield. My yield increases. We find that critical value. This is optimum versus coming out over here, which is maximum yield. OK? Go. That's a, actually a good question. The question was, if you're using different tests across the country or across the world, how do you, in fact, compare the, test, the same test, the two different tests on the same plot, and they compare them? And what they do, the idea is to basically figure out which is the best test for that area to get the interpretations. Um, you can certainly imagine if I have a, a more acidic soil versus a less acidic soil that certain tests would be better. Okay, you can certainly imagine if I have um, more uh, uh, different types of textures, activity cation exchange capacity, if I have a high activity clay versus a low activity clay, you can certainly imagine those types of characteristics will. How do you know that when you're How do you, so how, the question was how do you know which one is better um, the tests themselves aren't better than the other. I mean, we can, you can talk about the waste products and things like that. But the, the way we, um, we make the decision about which is better is basically on the plant's response to those tests. Okay, so um, in, around here we say we tend to like to use Morgans more than Malik. Now, you go to Pennsylvania, they tend to use Malik more. Um, and the reality is that our soils, are in, in the southern tier, is pretty much the same as the northern tier of Pennsylvania, southern tier of New York. But if you look at the entire expanse of New York State, the response, the plant response to the test is better with the Morgans than it is with the Malik. So that's the decision that we make. It's re more reflective of a plant's ability to extract the nutrients than the Malik, at least in New York. Does that make sense to everybody? Yeah-ish. Okay. So I need, I need a test. Okay, I have two different landscapes. Okay, uh, and, and they have different soil characteristics, right? Okay, you can certainly imagine that different tests are going to reflect different amounts of nutrients that are, are, are extracted by the test. Okay, the tests, these tests are not a total digestion. They're trying to reflect the plant's ability to extract nutrients. Okay? So if I have a landscape here that has different soil textures, different pHs, than the landscape over here, 
the plant's ability to extract those nutrients are going to be different in these two, 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 two locations. Okay? We want to have a test that is reflective of that plant's ability. So New York State, Morgan's happens to be the better test to reflect that plant's ability to take nutrients out. Pennsylvania, the people in Pennsylvania feel that the Malik is. Okay? Now, if you start moving more into the Midwest, you're going to see much more of the Malik. If you start moving more into the Northeast, you're going to see much more of the Morgan. Make sense? It just happens to be the Midwest is different than the Northeast. Okay. So we, this slide makes sense to everybody? All right. Once we figure out what's there, we basically have to make some decisions about what we're going to be using to get those nutrients into place. Okay? Now, those decisions are based on nutrient availability. And so you've seen this slide before, but we're looking at the concentration of the nutrients in the solution, the speed of nutrient replacement, as well as the mobility of that nutrient. Okay, so what are the decisions that we, or the things that we need to think about? Well, first is, from a fertilizer's perspective, we need to understand how much nutrient is actually in that fertilizer. Okay? We have basically two different, generally two different types of fertilizers that are on the market. Okay? One is sort of complete fertilizers, which is a sort of like broad spectrum vitamin. You know, it's a broad spectrum nutrients. Um, it's multi-nutrient or like a multivitamin. Okay? The problem here is this is generally not cost efficient for commercial growers. Okay? If I get a multivitamin and I put it in my body, some of those nutrients that are in that vitamin I'm going to be using, but a lot of it's going to be basically coming out you know, into the toilet, right? Okay? Well, from a farmer's perspective, that stuff that's going out as pee is basically waste. Okay? Now, from a gardener's perspective, that may not be problematic because you've got to think about how this stuff costs and the convenience of its use. We have simple fertilizers, which is basically it's providing one nutrient or maybe two nutrients. From a farmer's perspective, because they're buying in bulk and they need to maximize their dollars, that might make sense. But from a home gardener's perspective, that's totally off the charts. I need to have a little bit of this, a little bit of that, a little bit of this. I need to do the math to figure out what it is. Why? I mean, are, how many of you guys take just vitamin A or just vitamin B? Most of us, when we took stuff, we're taking multivitamins, right? Broad spectrum approach, OK? All right, the next thing that we need to think about is we need to think about the release rates, how fast this stuff is going to go off, OK? It's going to uh, not go off. How fast this stuff is going to become available, all right? Most inorganic fertilizers have a very fast release rate. That's not true for all of them. There's a couple that are slow. Rock phosphate is a good example of that, OK? But they release very fast. And if they release very fast, this can be somewhat problematic. Okay? If I put it out there and it releases fast and my plants are not prepared to take all of that nutrient, where's that nutrient going to be going? Downstream. Okay? On the other hand, we can potentially have slow release. Most of the organic fertilizers release fairly slowly. Okay? Mineralization is slow because of decomposition rates. Now, this is a good thing because I'm not necessarily going to lose it from the system, but what's the probable, what's, what's a possible negative to this? It might not be supplying enough for the plants at their moment of need. Okay? So most operations are thinking about a combination of these things. There's advantages and disadvantages of it. Now, Dillman Hill, we aren't using the inorganic, because we're trying to do more of an organic operation, and part of the philosophy is we're going to be using organic sources. Okay? Well, you guys saw the results of the nutrient analysis. They have a lot of availability. Well, why? How do they overcome this slow release? They go with abundance. Right? OK. All right, other considerations. Availability and cost. And really, the reality is I probably should have separated these out. Okay? Certainly, you can understand the cost. If something's more expensive than another, 
I'm not going to, I get better bang for my buck if I go with less expensive stuff. But just because something is more expensive doesn't necessarily mean you're getting less value from it or potentially more value from it. Okay? You actually have to think about what the spec is of that fertilizer, the NPK. Okay? Let's use this for example. Okay, I've got a fertilizer that's 10, 10, 10, and a fertilizer that's 20, 20, 20. I don't know what fertilizer. It's just those are the specs on them, all right? Okay. This one costs ten dollars. Or make it hundred, which is more a little bit more re reasonable. Hundred dollars. Okay. This one, that's for a poor poor hundred pound bag. Okay, so hundred pounds. Okay, this one costs 150 per hundred pound bag. This one's more expensive, but for half again the price, I'm getting two times the value. Does that make sense? So in this scenario, if I, if I needed to get 10, 10, 10 on my field, I could just sort of cut this in half, and I get a cheaper price. Does that make sense? Question. They do take that into account, and that's that first, that's this effectiveness thing, They're sort of these release rates. Sorry. So the 10, 10, 10, or the 20, 20, 20 re represent this, the nutrient content. The release rates and availability, that basically re represents this component, the release, I mean literally release rates. Okay. So they're thinking right there, they're thinking, what's my nutrient content? And the, in that fertilizer, they're going to have an understanding about how quickly it's going to get to my plants, or how slowly. They also need to think, this is this issue of cost. Okay? Those two could be basically, the 20, 20, 20 could be just concentrated 10, 10, 10. I mean, it literally could be the same thing, just concentrated. Or it could be something different. And that's where they're going to start thinking about the, the, the spec and the release rates. Okay. Now, I've been mostly focusing on cost, but you also have to think about availability. Okay. In the United States, pretty much anything we want we can probably get fertilizer-wise. We may have to pay for it, but there are ma major parts of this world that they, nece they can't necessarily get any kind of fertilizer they want. Okay. They may be able to get the rock phosphate, for example, here, uh, they may be able to get the rock phosphate, but they probably can't get the, the sulfur-coated urea. Okay? That's a consideration that they need to take into account for their fertilizer applications. Okay? And that's where availability comes in. Okay? Now, um, if you think also about this cost and availability, you also need to think about the cost and availability of, of transport and application. Okay? If, I mean, the example that I have here is if I have lots of organic matter, okay, the reality is most organic matter has a lower spec, a lower analysis than some of these inorganic materials. And if I have to get 100 tons of nitrogen on my field, that might be 1,000 tons of organic matter. On the other hand, it might be 100 pounds of, well, it can't be 100 pounds, but it could, you know, it could be a different type of fertilizer that has a higher concentration. Okay, so not only do you have to think about the higher concentration when you talk about costs, but you also have to think about that higher concentration and the bulk of the material, how you're actually going to be able to transport it, which comes into this idea of convenience and ease of use. Okay, if I have something that is really bulky, I have to have the equipment to move it. On the other hand, if I have something like anhydrous ammonia, which is basically uh, a liquid, I actually have to have the equipment to apply that. Okay, great, I can buy this really cheap. Anhydrous ammonia, no, um, liquid gas, sorry. I can, might be able to get this really cheap, but if I don't have the equipment 
to get this in the field, I basically just have big containers of expensive stuff. Right? Does that make sense? Okay. Urea, on the other hand, is ammonia, basically ammonia-based stuff. Urea, on the other hand, I can broadcast spread if I needed to. You know, so if I don't have the injection equipment, okay. So right there is another decision that's going to be based on the issue of how I'm going to get the nutrients in there, how expensive it is, can I get it, and how am I going to be putting it in the field? Does this make sense to everybody? The last thing that they really think a lot about is this issue of side effects. Okay, um, if you guys remember those nutrient analysis results that we got back from Agro One, right? There were recommendations on how you actually apply the stuff. It wasn't just what you apply, but how you apply it. A lot of that how you apply it has to do with issues of side effects or waste. Okay, certainly if we put a lot of fertilizer on there at one time. Theoretically, we can get a lot of soluble salts, which potentially will damage the plants and the microbes as well as the other fauna that are in the soil. Okay? Another example is organic matter. If I'm not organic matter per se, well, if I'm applying barn waste, manure, okay, and it's coming out as a slurry, and I'm applying it to my fields, I could theoretically seal my soils. I could clog them. Okay? And if I clog my soils, I potentially can have anoxic conditions. If I have anoxic conditions, I can produce organic byproducts that could actually be toxic. I start seeing ammonia. The ammonia starts damaging my roots and my plants. Okay? Does that make sense? Okay. It's not that organic matter is bad or the salt that you put up here. It's actually how you apply it and its byproducts. Go. It's coming from the fertilizer. Yeah, so as the fertilizer, um, as the fertilizer decomposes or becomes available, those salts, depending on the rate of, I mean, classically, we, we generally associate this with inorganic fertilizers. But you guys saw with the mulch products, uh, the compost products, they had fairly high salts in them. You had to remember the high pHs that you got off of the, the, the compost? Okay, that had high salts in it as well. So you have to think about these. It doesn't matter what the source is. You have to think about the po possible salt solution coming, or the salts coming from this material. Does that answer your question? You can ask a follow-up question. <laughs> Is there, so the question is, is there a chemical fertilizer that has more tendency to have salts? Well, all of them are salts. So it, I think it has more to do with how you apply it. If you, it, you pick the fertilizer, if you put too much of it in, you're going to get the salts that are going to kill stuff. So I think part of the consideration here when you think about the soluble salts is thinking about what my material is and what my plant needs are and providing the the nutrients, whether it's inorganic or organic, or nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium, whatever it is, to apply it at a rate that meets the needs of the plant, and I am not, in essence, wasting it. Okay? Because this is waste. Yeah, we can talk about the toxic effects of it, but if, if I'm getting this kind of stuff, I'm wasting my fertilizer, whether it's clogging, whether it's salt buildups, whatever it happens to be. Does that make sense? Okay. Uh, obviously, there's the issue of leaching when you start talking about nitrates and stuff like that. So, and when we get high levels of phosphorus, this stuff gets into the groundwater and this moves out of the system. Okay. Also, we talked about this um, when we are talking about uh, uh, bringing nutrients into a plant. Do you guys remember the difference between if it's a nitrogen, if the nitrogen source is a nitrate versus an ammonia? The plants are going to be using different types of proton pumps. Okay. If we are putting in an ammonia fertilizer, we're basically going to be acidifying our soils. Now, it may be a very local and it may not be that big of a deal, but if your fertilizer source is ammonia, the ammonia needs to get into the plant via proton pump, okay? which means the ammonia is coming in, but protons are going out. And if the protons are going out, they're basically going to be acidifying the rhizosphere. 
right? Now, if I wanted to counteract that, maybe I should be thinking about using nitrate as my ni end source. Because I put the nitrate in, it's a negatively charged ion, and potentially the protons are going to be coming in to maintain that charge balance, right? And if I'm pulling stuff, nit protons out of the soil solution, I'm raising the pH around my rhizospheres. Does that make sense? So these are side effects that you have to think about. The last thing is you also have to think about secondary deficiencies. This goes back to that barrel analogy. Okay? You guys remember the barrel analogy with the slats in it? Okay. If, I, if my nutrient of law, of my nutrient of deficiency, or the, the most limiting nutrient is nitrogen, and I say, okay, I'm going to put nitrogen fertilizer in the system to, to where I'm going to get optimum growth, you may not, in fact, get optimum growth. Why? Well, go back to the barrel analogy. We'll make this a really big barrel with just two slats. Okay, here's my barrel. Okay. And this barrel, for whatever reason, just has two slats. One of them happens to be nitrogen, the other one happens to be phosphorus. Right? Well, if these slats, nitrogen is right here and phosphorus is right here. You guys see the difference there? Yeah? And I say, okay, well, I'm going to get nitrogen, all the nitrogen it needs. I'm going to make this slat all the way up here. So my nitrogen is now up here. I'm not going to get the response I expect. Because phosphorus is now limiting. I went right think about these secondary deficiencies. Does that make sense to everybody? OK. All right. So we think about what we're going to be adding for lives. OK, first we figured out what we need, and then we figure out how we're going to apply it, OK, or, or what we're going to use to apply it. Now we actually have to think about, well, I can actually, I've got my nutrients that I need. I actually can use some techniques to improve their efficiency or their effectiveness. OK? The biggest one is timing. When I apply my fertilizer, OK, I know my plants are going to need X amount. But if I put X amount in the beginning of the, the crop's life cycle, those plants are not going to get X. If it's nitrogen, it's going to be leached away or volatilized. And by the time the plants actually need it, they're not going to get it. So you have to actually think about when you're putting it on. And this is where this combination of doing slow release versus fast release. Okay? I use slow release fertilizers, whatever the source is, to basically meet the baseline needs of the plant. And then at certain periods of the plant's life, when it needs a boost or it has more demand for X fertilizer, for X nutrient, I should say, that's when you go in and you side dress with that fertilizer. Does that make sense? Yes, no, kind of? All right, I'm running out of board space. Think about this. OK, my plant response is like this. Now this is time, OK, and this is yield, OK? Generally, this is what we think about plants. This is how they grow, right? The reality is this is not necessarily a smooth line, OK? Because right in here, they're doing flowering, OK? Right in here, they're doing seeds at, or whatever it happens to be. Which means from a nutrient sense, this line, if I'm going to parallel this line. This is going to be nutrients, though. I don't have a different color, OK? Generally, if this is the lifestyle of my plant, this is what you would think the nutrient needs are. As the plant gets bigger, it's going to need more nutrients, right? No. In general, that may be true. But right around here, it potentially needs a spike of something. It's going to have more demand for something, OK? If that's the case, I'm going to have to have a spike of nutrients right about there. And right about here, it's going to have another demand for something extra. OK, so as a result, I'm going to have another spike. I need to tie my application based on where my plant is in its life style, lifestyle, <laughs> life cycle. Does that make sense to everybody? Yeah? OK, that's what they're talking about here when they talk about timing. OK, now, let's think about how we're actually going to deliver. Okay? 
it's all well and good for me to say, hey, you need to get some nitrogen out there when it's going in through fluorescence or something like that. But how you actually get it out there, that's another consideration. Okay? We have a number of different methods that you guys should be familiar with. Broadcast, injection, or banding, and banding. Soluble, it's coming in through liquid sources, or a foliar spray. Okay? Now, each one of these methods basically has some serious advantages as well as some serious disadvantages. Okay? Let's start with broadcast. Broadcast is basically you're literally just sort of spreading it out there. Okay? Uh, old pictures of uh, farming in Europe and Asia where you can see people broadcasting seed and stuff like that. That's what this means. Okay? Its advantages, it's really fast. It's easy to do this. And it's really convenient. It doesn't take a lot of equipment to do this. The problem with this is that if I'm doing this, I'm not necessarily guaranteed that those nutrients are going to where the plants are. Okay? So it may be poor nutrient accessibility. Okay? As well as if I'm broadcasting it on the surface, if I don't have good soil contact, that stuff isn't actually going to get into the soil very quickly. Okay? And then finally, if I have like an ammonium source, so I'm spreading out ammonium, or if this stuff volatilizes, through decomposition or whatever, it's not going down to the roots. Does that make sense? Okay. Next one is injection banding. Okay. This one really deals a lot with this issue of uh, volatilization. Basically, I'm reducing the soil interactions. I'm putting the nutrients as close to the roots as possible. So I don't have to have that cation exchange. You guys remember when a nutrient goes into soil solution, it potentially can be interacted with another soil solid. Okay, and it slowly makes its way to the root. Well, the closer I put that fertilizer to the root, the less distance it has to travel. Does that make sense? Okay. Um, because there's less distance and because I've injected it below ground, I have re re reduced volatilization. Okay. Now, the problem with this one, there's two problems with this one. Big disadvantage, if I get these nutrients too close to the roots, I potentially will get salt issues and toxicity. Okay. The other big advantage of this one is that often it, you have to have certain kinds of equipment. Okay. The next one is a soluble, okay, where the, uh, the nutrient is in soluble form so I can deliver it with water, okay, my irrigation. You know, whatever I'm watering with, there goes the nutrients. And the nutrients are moving through mass flow, which makes the delivery of the nutrients a lot easier to get to the roots. Right? Makes sense? Okay. Um, and because it's a soluble form, I can really control the application rates. I can tell, I can, you know, I can put the concentration I want in that water, and it will deliver that amount with that water to that plant. Make sense? Okay. Issue here is a couple. One is this is pretty bulky. This is it's concentrated. You got to have the equipment to do the mixing. You obviously have to have an irrigation control. Okay, and there's cost. This stuff is fairly expensive. This is like buying miracle Girl. Has anybody gone to the, gross, uh, gross, the Agway or something like that and looked at the prices of miracle Girl versus a dry fertilizer? It's pretty expensive stuff. OK. Um, last one, and we don't really do this a lot around here, but it is done a, a fair bit, is basically foliar sprays, okay, where you're literally spraying. Instead of putting it on the ground, you're literally spraying it onto the, you know, as a spray onto the plants. Okay, generally because it's going right onto the plant, there's a fast response. Um, and because you're doing the spraying, you've got really accurate timing. You don't have to deal with the soil immobilization. Okay, the nutrient goes in the soil, it's got to go through the scattering exchange comp complexes if it's not going through mass flow. All right, so you don't lose that potential uh, um, nutrient delivery at, at the timing that you want it to be. Now, the problem with this is, it rains in the world. And if it rains in the world, you know what's going to happen to that stuff it's a, if it's a foliar spray. It's going to get washed off the plant and down into the soil, which puts you right back to probably this sense up here. Okay? Depending upon my, root, my plant architecture, if it rains through, I'm going to have through flow. It's, the stuff's going to be falling off. Now, potentially, I'll also get stem flow, so I'll have some concentration around my stem. But question? Okay, so the question is, what is the plant uptake in, in foliar sprays or leaves versus roots? Um, there is a limitation in what types of nutrients that you can do. Um, 
but I am, I can't speak that much on it. I don't know a lot. I mean, I I don't know a lot about the actual uh, the mechanism that the plants take that in. Um, there is a limitation on the types of roots, and there's a limitation on the amount of concentration that you can put in as the spray. But other than that, that's sort of the limitation of my knowledge on that one. Okay. Questions? Any other questions on this one? No? All right. So what does this actually look like? Uh, I put This is out of your book, just to give you guys an idea. Um, so broadcasting on the surface, you can take, certainly it's just sort of spread out there. Often when people do that, they will then integrate it, plow it down some way, you know, so that it gets into the soil. Um, again, you're still going to have this specificity issue, but you can see, depending on how you disc it or, or mold or plow it, you can definitely put this stuff in different locations in your soil. Um, banding at planting time, you're basically putting in sort of like a, a tube applicator, and you're basically putting the fertilizer down here. The plants will then move to it. You put it as close to the roots as possible. Uh, deep injection or point injection. Point injection is basically a series of deep injections, basically a blade which, uh, with, a, uh, with basically a, a plastic pipe behind it that it sort of injects stuff as, it, as the blade cuts through. Uh, fairly simple, it's fairly similar to the banding. Um, in banding, though, they generally re you're basically creating cut, drop the stuff in, and then cover it. In this case, you're basically just cutting through and not recovering because the soil is just basically sealing itself back up. A drip irrigation type of step where you're actually putting in soluble fertilizer into the liquid system. Now, this, can be, this is a drip system, but this could also be coming in as a flood system or a bath system or something like that. Okay? And then the foliar spray is literally what it think, you think it is. It's like you're going out there with a spray can and, or spray apparatus. Okay? Cool beans. All right. Of course, I've run out of time. Um, let's skip the last part. I got five minutes. Okay, we got five minutes, and we're going to do the. Uh, we're going to be doing in five minutes. We're going to do this. We're going to do the connections game. Okay. Now, you guys had three terms, right? You had. So you had nutrients. I'm not sure if this is in the same order, but you had nutrients, you had fertilizer, and you had management. Right? OK. So what I'd like you guys to do, and I, the problem here is, and I, this was my mistake on, on, on last class. I should have broken you guys up into three large groups and said, OK, you guys look at this connection, you guys look at this connection, and you guys look at this connection. OK, so I'm not really sure which connections you guys worked on. Did anybody work on the nutrients to fertilizer connection? OK, did anybody work? So there were a couple of you. Did anybody work on the fertilizer to management connection? Did anybody work? So that means a lot of you guys did the management to nutrient connection? OK, good. There's a good diversity of groups here. All right, so what I'd like you guys to do, bear with me. We only have five minutes. We can do this. OK, what I'd like you guys to do is we're going to, on the board, I'm going to ask whatever group it is to tell me what the connection is. And then we're going to write the connections down. Okay? And then what you guys are going to do over the weekend, take all these notes, over the weekend, you guys are going to write a paragraph of these connections. All right? All right, so let's start with the first one, which is nutrients fertilizer. OK, so N to F. All right. I saw some hands. Give me some Go. So they may, may be either in organic or inorganic form. Uh, OK, so inorganic or organic forms. OK, go. So FERT, that's two things then. FERT equals nutrients. OK. You can do it that way. That's fairly simple. And the second part was what? Excess FERT can equal loss of nutrients. OK, some more. There was more than two people that did this. 
Go. So FERT type equals availability. Good. Go. Uh, the concentrated nutrients from an unavailable source like E3 gas or iron phosphate into the fertilizers. Uh, so how do we write that? Uh, N2 gas to fertilizers. N2 concentration. And this is an example. Concentration. to fertilizer, right? Is that basically what you mean? Yep. All right, let's do the next one. How about FERT management? F management. Give me something. Soil history. Climate. So this is acidity. So soil. Somebody else. Say that again. Uh, a good management equals reduced loss, and that could be leaching or volatilization, right? Give me another one, guys. Economics. Economics. That's the one actually I wouldn't have thought of. Economics. Economics of the fertilizer, equipment, equipment transportation. crop, transportation. Another one? And then we're going to go to the, other, the last one. No? Feel good on this one? All right, let's do the last one. So we've done. Let's do nutrients and management. Oh, geez, is that bad? <laughs> All right, next. <coughs> Go. Uh, and I should say, I shouldn't say that. Nut So managing pH equals managing management of nutrient availability. Different nutrients have different concentrations. Different nutrients equals different management needs. Give me another one. Go. Different crops. Different crops. equals different management needs equals different nutrients. Is that what you meant? Go. Different, uh, different management techniques that breed individual matter will affect it. Oh, OK. Different <coughs> management techniques, we'll just say techniques, equals different nutrient availability. Okay. 
Any more? Somebody in the back? Go. Good, that's a good one. Uh, so management, soil climate equals, say it again. Different biology, bioactivity, and management needs. Is that what you said? Nutrient. OK. A lot of ammunition. Yes? All right, guys. One paragraph short, not, not a dissertation. All right? Have an awesome weekend, guys.